How can people go sit at a table with a regime that bombs hospitals and drops chlorine gas again and again and again and again and again and again? Are you supposed to sit there and have happy talk in Geneva under those circumstances when you've signed up to a ceasefire and you don't adhere to it? What kind of credibility do you have with any of your people? But you don't need to read these documents to understand it's against international law to bomb hospitals. You don't need these documents to understand that you don't drop barrel bombs on children. Or on relief convoys. Yeah. You know, John Kerry has the credibility to do that because he has been fighting yep. hard day in and day out to strike a deal with the Russians. And uh, I, I think most of America and the world community was waiting for that moment yesterday, and it was a, it was an important moment. Yeah, though you saw the Secretary of State in an impassioned moment speaking during a United Nations Security Council meeting yesterday. Joining us now, spokesperson for the State Department, John Kirby. Very good to have you. Thanks. Thanks morning. for having me back. So, uh, a possible change in policy uh, now. Uh, there's a possibility of supporting no-fly zones. Well, it's not really a change in policy, uh, Joe. What he's talking about, and he, he referenced this yesterday in the in the Security Council, is trying to move the cessation of hostilities forward in some sort of meaningful way. And one way that uh, you might be able to get there is if we just got aircraft out of the air. And there's only two types of aircraft uh, in northwestern Syria, in the areas where the humanitarian aid's not getting. Uh, and where the opposition is, and that's Russian and Syrian. And so what he was talking about was, you know, can we maybe just work on getting them out of the air well, how, long how, enough how, so that some we, of the aid can get in? Well, how do we get them out of the air when it's a strategy of Syria as well as a strategy of Russia to starve the people of Aleppo to death? Well, what we're, what our case is, is that there's no way this this war ends. If if they aren't out of the air, if we can't get a cessation of hostilities, the opposition's not going to stop, uh, and you're never going to get to political talks, and the war will just go on and on. And that's actually that's not in Russia's interest. And I think if they were being honest with you in a moment, they would tell you they realize that's not in their interest. The other thing is, they want. A cooperation with the U.S. military in Syria. They want this joint implementation center stood up. We've told them, and we were very honest this week, there will be no establishment of that if we can't get some calm and we can't get some aid to those people. If, if this continues, shouldn't the United States destroy Syria's airplanes on the ground? Well, I don't think uh, we're talking about uh, U.S. military solutions here. The president's been very clear uh, that uh, there's not going to be a military solution to the civil war in Syria. It's got to be political. But, but they are using military weapons to they starve are. the people of Aleppo to, to barrel bomb, as you said. Absolutely. The world community, does it really have any choice if it doesn't destroy their instrument, their, their instruments of warfare that they're using against their own people? then the slaughter, the genocide will continue. Well, absolutely it will, which is why we're pushing on Russia, which has influence over Assad and can get them out of the air if, they've, if they so choose. They've done it before, back in February, when the cessation of hostilities first started. We had a good two months where it wasn't no violence, but it was, it was pretty dramatically reduced, 70 to 80 percent. They can do it. What's not clear is whether they're willing to do it or whether they're actually able to do it, whether Assad is becoming resistance to, resistant to the influence that we know Russia has. But it was the Russians, though, that blew up the convoy, according to... Well, the there's government. only two types of aircraft flying over those areas, Russian and Syrian. I'll let them speak for themselves, uh, and I uh, won't get into intelligence issues here, but, uh, but, but we certainly know that there was no coalition aircraft over Aleppo or, or responsible for this in any way whatsoever. Well, look, it was, it was very clear from Secretary Kerry's comments yesterday that he's not happy with, their with the Russians' behavior. Absolutely. Okay, so fine. So you had an agreement. Everybody was happy we had an agreement for all the reasons you said. Now they have flagrantly violated violated in a number of ways. So at what point do you say to yourself, we can't do business with these people because they can't be trusted? Uh to, they can't be trusted. Well, I think you saw a lot of frustration from Secretary I saw Kerry, the frustration, is, but then what happens? Exactly. So, look, we've been very clear. We're, we're at a critical moment, and the Secretary talked about that. We're hanging on a thread here with this cessation of hostilities. Uh, and we've been very honest with them that the arrangement we arrived at in Geneva last week will not happen if they can't help us influence Assad to get 
to a cessation of hostilities and get that humanitarian so aid. So how long? But we're not, well, that's just it. Well, how I mean, long? I, I, think, I think today, look, there's a meeting today of the ISSG uh, right here uh, across the street. And, uh, and I think it's going to be a key, uh, key meeting to kind of figure out where we really are and moving this forward. I don't know the answer how long. I don't know how much longer it's going to take. Uh, but I can tell you that when the members of the International Syria Support Group met just a couple of days ago, all of them, all 22, Russia included, all agreed uh, that trying to move this forward was still worthwhile, that there was still there was still gas in the tank. And I think they want to see uh, just how much is, is left in that tank today. Admiral, well, yesterday, Admiral, yesterday at this time, uh, we had a leader of the Syrian opposition sitting in the chair you're sitting in right now, and she basically came on the show and was pleading for help from the West. She said, yeah. this has been going on. Someone has to step up and say, enough is enough. What do you say to her and the people who are suffering there right now? Well, obviously, we, uh, uh, we share their deep concerns, um, and we are fighting very hard on their behalf. I, I know that it doesn't always look that way to them. Uh, when you keep seeing barrel bombs being dropped and chlorine gas and images uh, 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 such as what you're showing right now and that little, to that little toddler in the, in the ambulance, I know it's hard. Uh, but we continue to believe that more war is not the answer, more violence isn't the answer, that we've got to get the, the two sides to sit down and talk about this and get a, gov a, a transitional governing process in place. Uh, and that can't happen unless the violence stops. But that can't happen unless the aid gets in. And so what I would tell her is we very much are squarely in their corner and we're working not just to stop the violence today but to try to stop the war tomorrow and to try to build a, a Syria where they can go home. I mean, we have like uh, almost six million refugees outside the country uh, and about that many displaced inside the country. These people want to go home uh, and that's going to take some time but we are absolutely committed. To is that. there a breaking point in which the United States would change its policy? and try something different and does that breaking point go but beyond the election I don't know the answer to timing, um, and I certainly wouldn't speculate one way or the other about uh, policy options. We have always said that this is the best option forward, that, that other options, plan Bs, if you will, uh, are not ideal. I mean, it's not that there aren't other things you can do, but none of them are better than trying to get the sides to sit down on the table and politically work through this. We've also, also always said that we're willing to consider other options going forward. If the political diplomatic track fails, it's not like there are aren't active discussions inside the interagency about what we could do if that happens. John right. Kirby, thank you very much. Thanks thank, for coming. Thank you, Admiral. Thank you, guys. Thanks Always for having me. Appreciate you being here. Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you want to keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.